What's up, everybody? Welcome into the Next Pats Podcast. I'm Phil Perry. We've got the great Dane Brugler on with us today on Next Pats. And the reason why this is a particularly special day for us is not just because we have Dane as a guest, but it also happens to be the day that Dane has released the beast every single year. One of the most exhaustive draft guides you will ever find. And I have been buying this thing since I started covering the Patriots full time in 2014. So I don't know how many of these editions of the beast uh, Dane has put together, but every single year it is among the best things you can purchase. If you're a fan of the draft and if you're listening to this podcast in all likelihood, you are a fan of the draft. And what's great about it now is because Dane works for the athletic. All you need to do purchase an athletic subscription, bang, you're on your way and you're able to consume uh, all of the tasty draft nuggets that Dane has compiled with this beast guide you want quarterbacks you want edge rushers you want corners you want receivers uh they're all in here and you've got names on top of names on top of names with all kinds of information on all of them and then once you get through all of those there are even more names of guys with verified pro day numbers and so listen i'm, I'm looking at the quarterbacks pages here for instance 20 pages of quarterbacks information uh, from Caleb Williams all the way to Jason Bean out of Kansas. But he has in total 86 names listed here, including James Cahoon out of Bridgewater State, local guy, 6'4", 217, ran a 5'3", 740, uh, eight and a half inch hands. Like, there's no way I should have all this stuff at my disposal, but I do because... I have Dane's draft guide here sitting in front of me. So it's beast day. It's Dane Brugel conversation day here on next pets. Let's get to that right off the top, because I know you guys love hearing from Dane. We've got all sorts of good stuff on Drake may Jaden Daniels. This conversation happened back at the combine. Okay. So we've been holding on to this, holding on to it, holding on to it. Perfect day to drop it today. Uh, So you're going to hear some things that that might sound a a touch dated. uh, When we talk about trade downs, for example, Dane brings up the opportunity for maybe the Patriots to trade down with Atlanta, but they're not going to do that now. We know because Atlanta has Kirk Cousins. They're set at that quarterback position and all likelihood Atlanta is not going to be looking to move up to three, but otherwise all this stuff still holds. I can tell you ahead of time, Dane Brugler likes Drake may ahead of Jaden Daniels. He did back at the combine. He still does. Now he is his second rated quarterback. Drake may is to Jaden Daniels, who is rated number three. Caleb Williams is number one on Dane's draft guide this year. So a lot of May conversation. We're talking about the older brother theory. We're talking about May's ability to bounce back from mind numbing errors. (laughs) Uh, We talked plenty about Daniels as well. There's so much good stuff here. Let's get right to that conversation right now with Dane Brugler of The Athletic. Very excited now to have with us on the next Pats podcast, the great Dane Brugler covers all things draft for the athletic Dane, Dane, thanks so much for being on with us again, man. Every year around this time, we're able to get you and uh, we really appreciate it because we know you're a busy man right now. No, of course, this is going to be a fun week. There's a lot we need to figure out, especially when it comes to the Patriots. They're kind of the the linchpin of the top 10. I mean, how three goes, that's going to set up a domino effect how the rest of the top 10 plays out. So I'm, I'm anxious to talk about it. Okay, yeah, let's start there. I mean, we know or we think we know Caleb Williams will be the first overall pick. We're feeling good about that at this point? Clear favorite, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then after that, you start talking about the other two quarterbacks, Drake May and Jaden Daniels. If you're at three, does it dictate what you do if you're the Patriots, depending on who falls? Or are you just taking whoever lands to you? If I'm the Patriots, first and foremost, I'm going into this week crossing my fingers that all three of these guys crush it. I I want all three of these quarterbacks to do well in the interviews. They're not throwing, but just present themselves in a positive way. Because at number three, I want options. If that means taking a quarterback, great. If that means accepting some of one of these trade offers I'm certain to get, great. If I want to go with a top non-quarterback, I have that option. So when you're picking top three, which the Patriots haven't done in a long, long time, I want options, and so I'm hoping these quarterbacks crush it. You know, it'll be interesting to see if they do have the the attitude that no matter which quarterback's there, that's who we're taking. Um, I think this is a 
this week is going to be a process that's going to start that in terms the coach is getting familiar with these guys the scouts have been on the road they've had their meetings they have preliminary draft board with these quarterbacks but how do the coaches feel about them you know you have to be all in and let's not forget when you draft a quarterback in the top 10 it's an ownership decision so how ownership feels plays a part in all this so yeah it'll be really interesting if depending on which quarterbacks there are three and if the patriots have the same grade or if they have a clear preference about which quarterback they want to be there which one would you rather have fall to three if you're New England? I mean, I'm, I'm more of a Drake May. He's got the higher grade from me. Um, I understand both sides. I mean, Drake May, he a lot of times he felt like he had to wear the superhero cape and make things happen. And, you know, it, it was put him at a little bit of a disadvantage. Then you have Jaden Daniels, who credit to him, uh, what he did this year, 90 plays of 20-plus yards, uh, so explosive. The improvements he made uh, was uh, really, really evident and – you know, the situation he had at Arizona State to LSU, having the same play caller, the same situation two years in a row played a part. He's two years older than Drake May, two years more experience. So, you know, that plays a part. He also had four NFL receivers he's throwing to, including two that will be in this year's first round. All that plays a part. And so it's hard to contextualize when you compare these two players. But I think at the bottom, bottom line, they're both future starters. And when you're drafting a quarterback top five, the goal should not be find the next Patrick Mahomes. Let's let's just find a guy that we think could be a top ten quarterback in the NFL, someone that's going to help us compete for the division, compete for the playoffs. And I think you can make a case that all three of these top guys this year can do that. You do such a great job with the beast, your draft guide every single year, the most exhaustive, informative draft guide that's out there. And so I hope our listeners, our viewers, will pick it up when it's ready. I know it's it's you've got some time now. You got to let that thing cook, yeah, yeah. right? You're making me anxious. We got to give. Right. We got to let you take a breath and, yeah. and get down to business there. But you speak to so many people who understand who these prospects are, whether it's coaches, NFL people who've gotten a chance to know these guys. Which of these two that we're talking about right now, Drake May and Jane Daniels, do you think personality-wise? would be better suited to step into, let's be honest, what looks like it could be a very difficult situation year one just based on how the roster is set up in Foxborough. Well, and that's such a key part of this whole quarterback evaluation process is understanding are these guys mentally tough enough? I mean, you look at who has worked out and who hasn't a quarterback in the NFL, what's a common theme is the guys that are mentally tough, they usually figure it out. A guy like Jalen Hurts, you know, he had so many mistakes his first few years with the Eagles and a lesser quarterback is out of the league because he doesn't have that mental toughness to get past it. But you know what? Every mistake he made, he got better because of it. And so Jaden Daniels, Drake May, do they have that in him? And that's where the combine, that's the most important part of this. Not the 40-yard dash, not even the, the throwing. It's the interview process and trying to figure out their mental makeup, their wiring. Do they have it in them? And I think with both these guys, just surface level, it feels like they do. I mean, Drake May... He, he benefits from the older brother theory. You know, his older brothers, big-time athletes. He grew up playing ahead in, in sports because he wanted to play with his brothers. You know, he's getting he had to develop toughness at an early age to keep up with them. And then with Jaden Daniels, you think about what he went through at Arizona State. Uh, he was a four-year starter in high school, started as a true freshman. Goes to Arizona State, starts as a true freshman. He's had to overcome a lot of adversity uh, in his career as well. So surface level, it feels like both these guys have at least, you know, the, the makings of that mental toughness that you're looking for in a quarterback. One thing that's interesting about Drake May in particular, just from a personality perspective, mm -hmm. you know, Jane Daniels seems to be, you know, he's a, he's a California guy, sort yeah. of they got that laid back attitude. Drake May, and he's working out with... Philip Rivers right. has yeah. a lot of Philip Rivers to him, yeah. right? In terms of that personality, right, and I, right. I think that's a good thing. If you want oh, to invest yeah. in a guy at the top of the draft, confident, he is uh, effervescent. It feels mm -hmm. like at times, and I know it wasn't always great at UNC because the results weren't always great. Right. But maybe that kind of personality helps you mold yourself into that leader that you're looking for at the top of the draft. Yeah, it's a little bit of that screw you energy, you know. It's You, you need that. Um, but it's a fine line to walk because you're walking to a, a veteran locker room and uh, you have to understand how much to show, how much to pull back. Um, you know, he was a guy that took a lot of chances. And that's the biggest thing with Drake May is he has to come reel back some of those reckless decisions. Um, and that's not exactly just an easy thing. You f uh, a switch, you flip on and off. But at the same time, uh, you know, he's thinking about where Drake May is going to be three years from now. I, that, that's pretty exciting. So if, I'm a, if I need a, a quarterback in the top three, 
I'm feeling pretty good about my options, and that's also why I think the Patriots are going to get plenty of offers that are going to – it's going to be pretty enticing – the chance, if they don't head over heels about one of these quarterbacks, the opportunity to move back, pick up a lot of draft capital. And, and let's be honest, this is the Patriots team is not a rookie quarterback away from competing. So they're going to have options. If they do end up trading back, mm-hmm. how far would you suggest I was gonna ask you that. they should be willing to go <laughs> right. in order to still land one of these top, top, high-end physical talents, whether it's at receiver or tackle? I would right. think they would want to stay on the offensive side. Right. It seems like an offensive heavy top of the draft this no, year. No doubt. How far do you think they would want to go before they start getting out of range of right. you know one of these top two or three tackles or top two or three receivers? Yeah, and that, that'll be interesting. I, but I do think this is a draft where it's top heavy. It's in premium positions. We're going to see quarterbacks go early, receivers go early, offensive tackles go early. I mean, ideally, you're moving back to six with the Giants, eight with the Falcons. You're still within striking distance to possibly get one of these number one receivers or one of the top t- uh, two or three tackles. But I don't know. Let's just say, let's just say the Raiders. They say they give you the best trade uh, package. To, are you okay moving back to thirteen? That's that's a long way to go. But at the same time, if you look, if you're comfortable with these tackle this tackle class, and that's the best trade package, you know what? It, it's it's certainly possible. I don't know how Patriots fans would think about that. But you know, if you can get a say J C Latham, the tackle from Alabama, you can get him at. You feel comfortable getting him at thirteen, and you still get the best trade package. It's hard to trade away from some of these guys: Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, Joe Walt. It's hard to trade away from all these. What about Brock Bowers at thirteen? If you trade back, you know it's often. I know it's, you know, you're trading out of the top ten away from these quarterbacks to get a tight end on the surface level. It doesn't sound great, but at the same time, Brock Bowers is a fantastic talent who, and we, we know the Patriots and their history at tight end. So uh, you know, you just can't rule anything out. Well, and. He's a weapon. Brock Bowers is a weapon. That's how and we should be looked at. Elliot yeah. Wolf just told us earlier this morning we have to weaponize the <laughs> offense, is how he put it. What do you think the Packers would do? And the reason I ask that is because he's a he's yeah. pretty openly a Packers guy. He's mm-hmm. talking all about the Packers way and drafting and developing and playing young players. It's going to be a different approach in yep. New England with Elliot Wolf. Do the Packers in this scenario trade back? Do they stockpile assets or do they? I mean, we know under Ron Wolf especially how much they value just drafting quarterbacks yes. and continuing to draft quarterbacks until you find that guy and then continuing to do it even after that. What do you think they would do? What would Green Bay do in their situation? It, it's about getting the quarterback right, first and foremost. That's the priority. That's that's the mindset the Patriots need to have going into this process. But, again, you don't force it. You know, If you have to fall in love with the player and the person, and if you're not head over heels for these guys – you know, you have to come up with a plan B. And what does that plan B look like? Is it trading back? And, uh, you know, maybe they love Bo Nix. I think one of the biggest, uh, you know, misconceptions about the draft is that there, there's this consensus order of what the quarterbacks are for every single team. And Bo Nix might be the second quarterback for a team. You know, you just once coaches get involved, once, you know, we have everybody get involved, everyone give their opinions, and they build the board. And, again, it's, it's ownership plays a part in this. Everyone has a hand, and so who knows? Quarterback order is going to be very different team to team. We have no idea what the Patriots are going to prioritize, it, where they are in their current uh, build of this roster. Uh, they could prioritize young talent over someone who's more NFL ready. You know, it's just it's, it's hard to say. So it's uh, the Patriots fascinating for a lot of reasons. Last question I want to ask you because we are here in Indy. Which player are you most excited to see athletically here at the combine and let's try to i'll help i'll help you narrow it down okay. because we're so hot on receivers and offensive players in general it looks like there are going to be some phenomenal athletes at the receiver position this year anybody that that you're really excited to see perform this week in indy yeah i mean troy franklin from oregon's gonna blaze he, he's gonna run a really fast 40 uh the texas kids uh, xavier worthy and adnai mitchell i'm eager to see how they perform um it, it's a crowded receiver group i think you know, you have the top three with Marvin and uh, Neighbors and Adunze, and then I think Brian Thomas is part of that mix as well. And then that next tier of receivers is its a really jumbled mix of different types of pass catchers. And so if you run a fast 40, it's only going to help your chances of maybe going a little bit earlier. So uh, Franklin, I think Jalen Polk I'm really interested in. I don't know that he's going to run – blazing fast but can he run a respectable time uh receiver from washington so and then even on the defensive side at chop robinson the pass rusher from penn state can't wait to see what his 10 yard split is some of these corners quinion mitchell terry and arnold uh you know i think they're gonna run in the low four threes test really well so we've got some pretty impressive athletes there again elliot wolf earlier today acknowledged yes. height weight speed traits traits that's gonna be what that's they're the after and a few of those guys you just mentioned have some serious traits and they might be available 
if they want the quarterback at three, they might be available at the top of the second. Somebody like a Troy right. Franklin, right? Who that's, might run the fastest forty here among all the receivers. That's, that's it. The, the scouting motto: traits over production, and that's especially true with the Packers' way and what we could see the Patriots do. But at the same time, you know, you want to get the best all-around football player, and you know, that's the goal of uh, this week at Combine to try and figure that out. Awesome, Dane Brugler, read his stuff at the Athletic. Keep an eye out for the beast. Although, we're gonna give you. Uh, At least month. another month, yeah. A month. Give me a, a month. month. Four yeah. weeks. All right. You're on the clock. Thanks, Dean. Thanks. All right. Great stuff there from Dane. Love having him on the pod whenever we can. I do want to read without giving up too much information because I do want everyone to go out there, purchase a subscri- subscription, be able to consume this on your own. But I do want to give you a little taste of, of some of what's in the beast, given that this is our Dane Brugler episode pre-draft. And I do want to give you a little little bit of insight as to what he has on J.J. McCarthy, who is Dane's number four quarterback in this year's class. And the reason why I will specify uh, what he has on McCarthy here is because obviously we just heard him on Drake May. We just heard him on Jaden Daniels. But I think the choice for the Patriots could end up coming down to Drake May or J.J. McCarthy at three overall. And I've said all along, I've believed this uh, for months now. If the Patriots aren't convicted on the quarterback that is sitting there at three, then they will trade out. So if you're a big fan of Marvin Harrison Jr. going to the Patriots at three overall, if you're a big fan of Joe Alt going to the Patriots at number three overall, I'm not anticipating that that will be the case. They're taking a quarterback or they're trading back. Now, if they take a quarterback, is it Drake May? Is it J.J. McCarthy? Right now, as we sit here now, today, my guess is it would be Drake May. However, I believe the Patriots like themselves some J.J. McCarthy. I think they like a lot of what he brings to the table from an intangible perspective. I think they like a lot uh, of what he brings to the table from a mechanics perspective and from an athleticism perspective. But we've been over this. Elliot Wolf was the number two in Cleveland. And he was one of the driving forces behind the Cleveland Browns taking Baker Mayfield. One of the things that Elliot Wolf really liked about Baker Mayfield was this winning quotient that he felt he brought to the table, an intangible thing. Baker Mayfield, we know, was, you know, barely 6'1", a little bit undersized, mobile guy, could throw on the move, good arm. A lot of the same things you could say about J.J. McCarthy, and he's a little bit taller. But it was this winning attitude. It was this confidence that was bordering on cockiness. It was the energy that he gave his teammates, Mayfield did, on the field at Oklahoma. And Elliot Wolf, when he scouted him in person, he could see that. He could feel that. Did he feel the same way about J.J. McCarthy when he had the opportunity to watch him and be around him throughout the course of this pre-draft process? That's what I'm wondering. I, I think they like him. I just don't know if they like him enough to take him with the number three overall pick if they like him better than Drake May. That I don't know. But there are some interesting things here on McCarthy. So I'll I'll give you a quick run through, and I'm hoping to do even a little bit more on McCarthy, and I'm hoping we can get a great guest uh, that I'm still working on right now, but I think we'll be able to get him uh, on J.J. McCarthy here soon. But here is the strengths section on J.J. McCarthy from Dane Brugler's Beast Guide. And I'll just give you a little bit of it. I'm not going to give you the whole thing here. Again, you got to go find this for yourself. Above average athlete with quick feet and dashing speed drives through his hips with the arm strength to rip throws down the seam or to the sideline from the opposite hash. Hits his target in stride, especially when working over the middle. Needs to show it more, but there are several examples of anticipatory throws on his tape. See 2023 Ohio State. Takes care of the football, just four picks, three fumbles in 2023. High success rate on money downs, get this, 48.1% of his pass attempts on third or fourth down resulted in a first down in 2023. That is excellent. There's great stuff in here on his toughness. There's great stuff in here on how yoga has helped him prepare mentally for the rigors uh, that present themselves to him on the football field. This is the last note I'll give you on J.J. McCarthy from Dane. He says his coaches rave about his leadership intangibles and competitive drive. One NFL scout said, quote, before he signed, he was telling other Michigan recruits that if they wanted to party and chase girls, go somewhere else. 
his class was going to be the one that restored Michigan. To have that mentality and then actually go achieve it, he's different, close quote. Those are some of the great insights that you get here from Dane because he's so plugged in, because he knows so many people around the league that he's able to drop quotes like that one that makes his guide so valuable, in my opinion, and that makes this entire process so much fun. So that's the write-up on J.J. McCarthy. Again, when it comes to that intangible stuff, if Elliot Wolf is the guy with final say, and if Elliot Wolf loves those intangibles as much as he did with Baker Mayfield, I'm not saying, I'm just saying, I think we have to consider the possibility that he ends up with the Patriots. So why, oh, why are we so focused on McCarthy in May and not as much maybe on Daniels in May in this particular podcast? Well, it does feel as though the signs are pointing towards Jay Daniels going to Washington at number two overall. Weeks ago, we had Albert Breer with us on early edition who said the more people you talk to around the league, the more he gets the feeling that the commanders will be taking Jaden Daniels, the Heisman Trophy winner at number two overall. And now we have this from a recent Adam Schefter podcast. Schefter, obviously, everybody knows him here. The great NFL insider for ESPN. And on a recent Adam Schefter podcast, he said signs continue to point to this is something that he's following up on from a week ago when he said he felt as though maybe you could pencil in Jaden Daniels at number two overall for the commanders. He's holding to that. Here's some sound from Schefter's pod. On Monday, I was having a conversation with our friend Adam Levitin from Establish the Run, who does a great job. And he brought up the fact that on this podcast last week, we created some waves by saying that the signs pointed to Jaden Daniels going to Washington at number two. And Daniel, we're two weeks away. I still will stand behind that. The signs continue to point to Jaden Daniels going number two to Washington. So if we created some waves last week, here's some more waves. We're standing behind it right now. We'll see if anything changes in these last two weeks. And that would mean Caleb Williams goes one, Jaden Daniels goes two, and that would bring us to New England, which I think would have a decision to make as to whether it would take either Drake May, or J.J. McCarthy. Now, let me say this. A lot of people talking about New England moving out of that spot. I don't know about that. I'm not going to tell you they won't. Of course, they would for the right offer. But I think it's going to be challenging. I think for New England to trade out of that spot today, two weeks out, it's unlikely to happen. Because they're going to have to move back into a spot where they would lose out on the quarterback that they'd want. And there's going to be at the team that has to give up a lot to get up to number three, because we all assume it to be the Minnesota Vikings with their double ones. So I think the first three teams stay where they are in all probability. And I think in all probability, it goes Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, New England's choice of QBs. That to me is pretty strong. <laughs> when the Adam Schefter podcast is making it pretty clear how strongly he feels about where a particular player is going in the draft especially a draft like this one where there are so many quarterbacks at the top and there's so much information being leaned from people like Schefter, people like Albert Breer, who have so many great connections league-wide. Schefter's not saying that unless he feels really strongly about it. And I can tell you just knowing, and I don't know who Albert has spoken to when it comes to what he's heard, um, when it comes to the buzz on J.D. Daniels going to Washington. But I can just tell you when Albert Breer says something on our air or on 95 The Sports Hub or obviously on dmmqb.com, you should pay attention. He's he's that plugged in. And so it feels as though the Jaden Daniels dream, if you're somebody out there who wants the Patriots to select Jaden Daniels, I won't say it's dead yet, but it feels like it's dying. <laughs> Not to get too morbid on you. But it, it does feel like it's it's not going in that direction. And if it doesn't, is that an okay thing for the Patriots? I really think it is. And I'm on the record. I've said it here and elsewhere that I, I think Drake May is the best quarterback prospect in this year's class. Now, if I had to win a game tomorrow, I probably would want Jaden Daniels, quite frankly. But that's not what the draft is about. And there are so many things to consider that even go beyond the projection, which I think is so important. And it's why I like Drake May as much as I do. But you have to consider things like injury, and that 
does spook me. And I know it spooks teams a bit when you talk about what hangups they might have about Jaden Daniels. It's his frame and it's not only his frame, but it's his high scramble rate when he's pressured. That is his tendency is to take off and run. It's not to um, take off to extend the play, remain behind the line of scrimmage, throw on the move, create an explosive, explosive play, excuse me, in the pass game that way. There is some of that on his tape. But for the most part, when pressured, when moved off his spot, he scrambles to run. Now, obviously, uh, that helped contribute. That sort of play style helped contribute to his overwhelming explosive play rate. 90 plays of 20 yards or more this past season for LSU. He is absolutely dynamic. He is such an incredible runner. I understand why he would be looking for opportunities to run. And that's what will help him, I think, have immediate success in the NFL if and when he's playing, whether it's for the commanders or anybody else, even if it's for your New England Patriots. His speed, his athleticism, when the play breaks down, will lead to success. I am confident in saying that. I also feel as though that play style combined with both his frame and his running style, meaning his apparent inability to protect himself or his apparent unwillingness to protect himself. That to me would be a concern because that to me could lead to injury. And we all know the most important ability is availability. That's what Bill Belichick always used to say. I believe it. I mean, that when you talk about floors, I know Drake may, his floor has gotten a lot of attention and I understand that you have to be cognizant of it. You have to be thinking about it. But Jay Daniels' floor, quote-unquote, is plain and simple, not being on the field for you. There's nothing worse than that. And so that would worry me a tad. That's part of the reason why I'd be so comfortable with Drake May falling to me at number three if I'm New England. The other thing you have to pay attention to, I think, here, just when we're talking about these two guys, we've talked about this before, but it's just the situations that they're in. Now, Drake May did have Tez Walker, incredibly fast, good size, NFL caliber prospect, no doubt, at receiver. His offensive line was a disaster. And when you compare it relative to Jaden Daniels, where he has not only Brian Thomas Jr. is going to be a first-round pick in all likelihood at receiver, and Malik Neighbors, who is certainly going to be a first-round pick at receiver, but you have two tackles, it's my understanding, that are going to be really high draft picks it looks like next year. <laughs> so you're talking about one of the most nurturing offensive environments you could ever have at the college level. And I did recently come across some numbers uh, that would suggest as much. So pro football focus has what they call a wins above average metric. And they were able to compute this number for the surrounding casts for the top quarterbacks in this year's draft class over the last two years. So 2022 and 2023, how good is the surrounding cast for Caleb Williams? How good is that surrounding cast for Drake May, for Jaden Daniels, for J.J. McCarthy, for Bo Nix? And I'll give it to you in order for those five quarterbacks. Those are the five to me that are the most likely to go in the first round. Bo Nix, is he there or not? We'll see. But here it is in order. And I found this surprising. But again, this is over the last two years. Pro football focuses wins above average metric. So this combines the, the productivity levels, essentially, of your offensive line, running backs, receivers, and tight ends. Bo Nix comes in at number one from Oregon. His wins above average for his surrounding cast was 3.6. Then it's J.J. McCarthy, who's at 2.7. No surprise there, given how talented and how efficient Michigan was, especially on the offensive line. Then it's Caleb Williams at 2.5. Again. A little bit of a stunner to me, especially given what Jane Daniels had this past year, but be that as it may, that's how they came up with this. Then it's Jane Daniels at 2.21. And then at number five out of five is Drake May at negative 0 0.04. He's the only one with a negative wins above average figure among this tier. Negative 0 
And so again, what, how do these numbers get computed? How do they get tallied out? I'm just telling you that there are people out there that are trying to figure this stuff out. How good are these people surrounding Cass? Drake may, I think it's safe to say, whether you're, you're going off a pro football focus number or you're just watching it on the tape, it's safe to say did not have the best group around him. And if you're able to do something as Drake May's NFL franchise, wherever he ends up, that surrounds him with legitimate supporting cast, with legitimate receivers and real protection, what might you get out of him then? As productive as he was these last two years, two years ago especially, but you put him in an NFL caliber offense, not this air raidy run to grass kind of thing that he was in this past year. And you have a capable run game and you give him better coaching. What does he look like? Now, to me, if you're the Patriots, you have immediate work to do in terms of surrounding him with, with better talent than what you have on the roster here today, right now. He needs another receiver. He needs a tackle, a left tackle. Those are hard to come by. And so I'm not saying the situation he's going to be in next is great, but I am saying, given his age where he's 21, as opposed to Jaden Daniels, who's two years older, and the situation that he was in, as opposed to the situation Jaden Daniels was in, it's easier to let your imagination run wild with what he might be in a more nurturing environment, in an environment that is more conducive to a quarterback's success. Now, quite frankly, I'm not sure why I'm even making these arguments for Drake May at this point, because most of you out there, it seems, are believers of Drake May. And you would like for the Patriots to draft Drake May at number three overall. And the reason I feel somewhat confident in saying that is that you overwhelmingly opted for Drake May in this year's crowdsourced mock. This is our mock draft that is of the people, by the people, for the people. We do this every year. We have done this every year for the last several. It's become a bit of a pre-draft tradition on NBCSportsBoston.com. And with the first pick, when given the opportunity to take either Drake May or J.J. McCarthy or trade down, two different trade down scenarios, one that ended up with the Patriots having the earliest pick be number 11 and another trade down scenario with the Patriots having the earliest pick of number six overall. You chose Drake May. Over, over 70% of voters chose Drake May. And I understand why. And I think if he's there at number three overall, uh, that would be the odds on favorite from my point of view for what the Patriots would do. Round number two, number 34 overall, you took Kingsley Suamatai out of BYU, an offensive tackle. So you you go against the opportunity to take Oregon's Troy Franklin. You go against the opportunity to take South Carolina's Xavier Leggett or Florida State's Keon Coleman. All receivers that you could see playing along the boundary, different body types, different uh, strengths, weaknesses, skill sets. But all would help the Patriots pass game. Instead, you say, no, no, no. We are, we are a mature subset of voters. We are advanced in how we perceive what constitutes offensive success at the NFL level. We understand that you need a left tackle. So you go with Kingsley Suamataia. Over 34-inch arms, excellent athlete. He had a 9.38 relative athletic score. Broad jump of over nine feet. You can see him moving in space on his tape and just wiping out safeties and corners. Uh, this guy could be a lot of fun to watch, especially in this Alex Van Pelt run scheme where it, the more athletic you are as a tackle, the more you can get out on the move, get horizontal, some of these wide zone run schemes, if that's what they're going to implement, uh, he could be really, really effective. So like that pick for the Patriots, I, when I have done it, be a really hard decision for me to make between Sua Mataia and Xavier Leggett from South Carolina. I really like Leggett. And I know you need a left tackle. Could you get by with something else? Could you even get by with Mike Wenu at left tackle for a year? And maybe you have Chuck Sakura for play right tackle for a year. And it's not an ideal situation. I understand that. Those are critical positions, really hard to find. Boy, but I think Leggett could be really, really good. 4 3 9 40, 
unbelievable 40 inch vertical leap, just explosive plays down the field, catch and run opportunities. Six one two twenty one. He is NFL ready. There's a lot to like, I think there for Xavier Leggett, especially with Drake may. And if you're a little concerned about his, his accuracy or some of his mechanics and maybe making him a bit scattershot at times, I like having a big body there like that. You could say the same for Florida state's Keon Coleman, but I like having a big body there that, can win contested catches and go up and get a 50 50 ball. I think that's Leggett too. I think I would lean towards voting for Leggett, honestly, at 34 overall, if he's there over Sue, I'm tell you, but both good players. And I think both obviously uh, would fill dire needs with the third pick number 68 overall, you go with Jalen McMillan. This is a prototypical Patriot. You heard us mention it. Uh, one of only three players in this year's draft class that check all six boxes that we were looking for when it came to our prototypical thresholds at this particular position. And I'm thinking of Jalen McMillan as sort of a Jacoby Myers type, but with more horsepower. And that to me could be really, really valuable. Really good route runner, understands how to operate at the tops of his routes to create space. I think you could play him both inside and outside. We're in a 4 4 7. So again, he's got more juice than Myers. So you could play him outside. You know, he doesn't play outside all that much for Washington because they've got Roma Dunze. So that's okay. And Jalen Polk, like the, arguably the best receiver group in the country this past year. And so, you know, probably right behind LSU. But boy, I don't know. I think you can make the argument that they're number one. And so for me, McMillan being versatile, being a good athlete, understanding how to run routes, if you pass on that receiver in the second round, in the third round, I, boy. Uh, I think you could do a lot worse than Jalen McMillan. So I like that pick given the tackle choice at 34. All right, let's fly through these day three picks here. Round four, number 103 overall. You go Ben Sanat out of Kansas State. Now you pass on the opportunity to take some offensive linemen here. Dominic Pooney from Kansas. Tackle, maybe he's a guard, but boy, really good athlete. Seems to uh, fit exactly what Elliot Wolf and this Packers executive tree would be into at that tackle position. He was a prototypical Patriot this year. Cooper Beebe, in terms of an interior offensive lineman, uh, also from Kansas State. You pass on him. I've seen comparisons to Logan Mankins for Cooper Beebe. How is he still available in the fourth round if he's getting Logan Mankins comparisons? I don't know. But he was on the Pro Football Focus mock draft simulator. Anyway, you guys pass on those two in order to draft Sonat, who's a really good athlete, 10-6 broad, uh, you know, shuttle time of four, two, three, 40 inch vertical. I mean, at 250 pounds, that's pretty special explosiveness. So as a yards after catch kind of tight end, I like, I like him in this new England system. Now, is he a little redundant with Hunter Henry? Would, would you be better off getting like a true Y that could just move people off the line of scrimmage? Uh, a tip Raymond from Illinois, potentially. It was at 270 pounds, just about, and maybe the best blocking tight end in this year's class. Somebody you could probably get a, le- a little bit later, even on day three. Um, you know, would you rather have that to pair with Hunter Henry as opposed to another guy who's, you know, sort of in that quote unquote move mold? Uh, maybe, but I think right here, the fans are saying eh, it's an opportunity to get a real player. And Who knows how long Hunter Henry is going to be around. And if this guy projects someday to be like a true number one receiving option at tight end, like let's just make sure we go get that guy. We can get a guard later. Let's get the tight end right now. Uh, You do get your guard later. Fifth round, 137 overall. It's Tanner Bordellini out of Wisconsin. Now, to be quite honest with you, I don't know if people just saw Wisconsin offensive lineman and they didn't even think about the name. They didn't even go read anything about Tanner Bordellini. And he ends up with uh, almost half the vote here. Uh, on our Twitter poll for this particular selection, but good choice. <laughs> However you got there, uh, maybe the quickest lineman in this year's draft class with a four, two, eight short shuttle. That is remarkable for somebody who's, you know, going to be over 300 pounds. Uh, I might've gone with TCU's Brandon Coleman here because to me, he's more of a guard slash tackle as opposed to a um, guard slash center, which is what it looks like Bordellini will be at the next level. But if he ends up being able to play all three spots in the interior and he's a pretty good athlete and Cole Strange is dealing with injury and, you know, David Andrews is uh, closer to the end than the beginning, I think it's safe to say, at center. 
this might not be a, a bad investment in the fifth round. Sixth round, you go with the corner, Miles Harden, University of South Dakota, one of my favorite under-the-radar prospects in this year's draft class. Unbelievable quickness, 398 short shuttle, 688 three cone. He was one of our prototypical corners uh, in this year's draft class. Loves to hit. Loves it. He, he reminds me a little bit of, and he's bigger than this player, but in terms of his willingness to throw his body around, he reminds me a little bit of Marcus Jones. If you remember Marcus Jones coming out of Houston, not only was he a rocket ship in terms of his speed and his athleticism, but that dude wanted to hit people. He wanted to lay you out. He did not slow down when contact was imminent. And I feel the same way about Miles Harden. And so maybe he ends up at safety, but I feel good trying him at corner, seeing how well that works and going from there, because I do still think you could use some depth at that position if you're the Patriots. Six rounds, you went with Cedric Johnson, an edge defender out of Ole Miss. You had to go with an edge defender with this selection because I, I gave you nothing but edge defender options with the four choices uh, on Twitter, the poll, and they were all good athletes. But I really like that you picked Johnson out of Ole Miss because of the size. And you're talking about somebody who's six foot three, 260 pounds. So he is, he is built to take on tackles in the run game, play on early downs, but he's athletic enough and he's explosive enough, 38 inch vertical, uh, to I think get after the passer with a little bit of just a little bit of fine tuning. Um, and I'll just give you a little nugget from because this is still the Dane Brogler draft guide edition of Next Pats. I do want to give you just a little nugget on Cedric Johnson that I found interesting that I did not know uh, from this year's beast. Here's from Dane now. Quote. Named the 2023 Chucky Mullins Courage Award winner was Cedric Johnson, which is given to the Ole Miss defensive player that embodies courage, leadership, perseverance, and determination. How do you not like that? How does that not sound like a, a Gerard Mayo type or an Elliot Wolf type? They, they want toughness. They want leadership. They know they need that in their locker room as they turn over from, you know, the dynasty era, which is, let's be honest, a few years ago now, uh, into whatever comes next. So they want those kinds of high character guys. If you can get that in the sixth round, somebody who also has the physical upside to be regular for you on the edge of your defense, premium position. Hell yeah, Cedric Johnson, give me that guy all day long. And then with the last pick, seventh round, number 231 overall, you went with Bub Means, wide receiver out of pit. He was a corner of Tennessee, then he transfers to La Tech. And he's a receiver, and then he transfers again to Pitt. And he has a pretty damn good year. He's over 700 yards receiving. He ends up uh, earning his way to the Shrine game. 6'1", 212, low 4'4s four in the 40, almost a 40-inch vertical. It's a pretty rare athlete for somebody who's that size. So, hey, if this is the scenario where you pass on the opportunity to draft Leggett and you end up taking McMillan, who maybe you view as, as more of a, a Z option, somebody you can play inside and out. It's going to run you those nice routes, but isn't a take the top off the of defense kind of guy. You know, do you feel like you end up getting that in Bub Means on a flyer late on day three? I'm not saying that's what he's going to be. If, if anybody could say that with any kind of certainty, he's going much higher than in the seventh round here. Uh, but I think in terms of a height, weight, speed prospect, a uh, really, really nice option for the Patriots there in the seventh round. All right, that's going to do it for this edition of the Next Pats podcast. We really appreciate you listening to us. We appreciate John the Skull Crusher, Henry, for throwing this thing together. We appreciate Dane Brugler for being on with us and then putting as much damn work as he puts into the beast every single year. Make sure you go and check that out on The Athletic right now if you haven't done it already. Uh, so much great stuff in there. Hopefully, uh, you're feeling as though we were able to share some of that great stuff with you here, and it just continues to deepen your love for this entire draft process. That's what we're trying to do here and have some fun with it. At the same time, we're going to have another Next Pats update for you on Friday. We're going to be hearing from Mel Kuyper. We've got a Spencer Rattler interview to throw your way if the Patriots end up trading down. They end up trading down and they don't take a quarterback number three overall. Do they go the Rattler route? Say on day three. I don't hate that option. You'll hear a great conversation that we had with Spencer Rattler earlier this offseason. So stay tuned for that. We'll talk to you next time.